This last Sunday of the church here focuses our attention on the fact that Jesus Christ, our Savior, is King of kings and, and Lord of lords. And what a great great comfort that is for us to rejoice and to know that, that Jesus is and remains King, ruling over all things for our eternal good. Will we make use of the red hymnals this morning? Following the order of service of the word that begins on page 38, we begin with the singing of our opening hymn. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, He has removed your guilt forever. You are His own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to His will. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by your victory you have broken the power of the evil one. Fill our hearts with joy and peace as we look with hope to that day when every creature in heaven and earth will acclaim you King of kings and Lord of lords to your unending praise and glory. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. First lesson is recorded in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 34. For this is what the sovereign Lord says I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. But the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to turn to Psalm 23 on page 72 in the front of the hymnals, and we join together to sing that song.
Second lesson is recorded in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Alleluia. stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel is recorded in Matthew chapter 27, beginning with verse 27. And then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. This is the Gospel of our Lord.
grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. For God, for our meditation this morning, our gospel reading recorded in Matthew chapter 27. My dear Christian friends, if you saw a man in a palace dressed in a royal robe, wearing a crown on his head, a scepter in his hand, and his subjects bowing down before him, you would easily recognize that that person was a king. Well, that's the picture that we have of Jesus in our reading this morning, and yet Jesus doesn't look anything like a king. His crown is made of thorns, pressed down on his head, causing him to bleed. His staff is used to beat him. The soldiers bow down in mock worship. Hail, King of the Jews! They didn't realize, though, just how true their words were. But Jesus is not just a king. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. But as king, Jesus comes in great humility in order to save us. As our king, he willingly suffered all this. He willingly went to the cross to suffer the punishment and there on the cross won the victory for us over sin, death, and Satan. And on this final Sunday of the church here, we rejoice in the fact that Jesus is our King. What those soldiers said, intending to mock Jesus, we sing with great joy. A hail King of the Jews. While Jesus is a King rejected by many, the truth is that He is the King of Kings. As we view the scene, we might wonder, why would these Roman soldiers be so cruel? And to mock and taunt someone who appeared so weak, someone who had been sentenced to die the cruel death of crucifixion. Consider the times in which they lived, the empire that they served. Now, it was Roman policy really to humiliate and torture the condemned. Those who had earned the punishment of crucifixion were to be put on public display. And they're on the cross, nearly naked, pinned to wood, bleeding and gasping and dying. And the cross, therefore, everyone to see. To see that Rome was the superpower of the day. Its soldiers were the greatest warriors in the world. They look down on anyone and everyone. And crucifixion said, well, if you mess with Rome, this is what happens. And yet to fashion a crown of thorns, to put a robe on him and to mock him in such a way really went beyond the usual treatment of the condemned. The fact was the, the soldiers didn't take anything about Jesus seriously. Now, everyone in Jerusalem would have known about the, the triumphant entry there into Jerusalem that occurred at the beginning of the week on Palm Sunday. The Romans knew about all the Jews that were on hand there for the celebration of the Passover. How the crowds had hailed Jesus and shouted that he was the, the son of David, the Messiah, the King of the Jews. And no doubt those soldiers weren't impressed with such a king. Because after all, what kind of king could Jesus be? So weak and seemingly helpless? And really, king of the Jews seemed like foolishness to them. There was no king, no ruler but Caesar. Judea was a, a, a conquered territory. And for all the, the commotion that the Jews made about this man and, and their God, say, so what did the Romans care? 
how powerful, how significant could the Jewish God be if his people were nothing more than an insignificant province of the great Roman Empire? They'd been conquered and ruled by great Rome. And so if this Jesus was a king of any significance, perhaps, well, where's his army? Where was his great show of might and power? In fact, they might have laughed. Was this this carpenter from Galilee the best that the Jews could come up with for a king? As really as they mocked Jesus, they were mocking the rebellious people of, of his nation. Since they were letting every single Jew see what the legions of Rome thought about the Jews' holier-than-thou attitude that they were the chosen people of God, that they had been blessed with a Messiah King who would lead them to everlasting glory. And all of it was a joke to them. It's that attitude I mean, is prevalent in our world today as well. That Jesus and his word are most part despised by the wise and learned. That Christianity and the Bible are often mocked as being old-fashioned and outdated. I think how many of those who our world would consider to be the most intelligent, the most influential, the most powerful, would consider Christianity and the Bible to be foolish. Now, how many in our society don't want to hear anything that the Bible has to say because well, it speaks against sins and against lifestyles that they hold near and dear. And so often, Christians and their faith are mocked and ridiculed. That Christianity is treated with disgust, ridiculed by many in, in entertainment. Think of how many, how often isn't it that people just want Christians to be quiet and you know, keep your religion to yourself? It's so often in our world, in our society, it seems that the only thing that people can agree on is their hatred against Christianity. We also do well to ask ourselves, what kind of king are we looking for? Aren't we too often looking for a king too who will display that outward power and glory, show that glory in some great fashion for all to see? We're not looking for a king who comes in such humility. After all, we don't want to be ridiculed for our beliefs. And so aren't we at times tempted to think that well, maybe some of those teachings in the Bible just don't speak to people living in a modern society? Especially tempting maybe when we see even other Christian churches ignoring or changing those teachings of the Bible that seem to make us unpopular or seem to make our lives more difficult, or require sacrifice on our part. So even if we would never mock or ridicule like those Roman soldiers, maybe at times it's easy for us to remain silent, and really by that silence to deny some part of Jesus' word. Now how easy for us to, to join with our world and was not take all this religious stuff so seriously. We don't want to be seen as some some holy roller and ridiculed as such. Well, those Roman soldiers, their trust, their focus was no doubt on the strength and the power of their government and their empire. And the Romans certainly were arrogant in their thinking. Rome was Again, the superpower of the day. Its soldiers were the greatest warriors the world had ever seen. And they felt themselves superior to, to those that they had conquered and subdued. We who are citizens of a modern day superpower we might be tempted to, to feel similar arrogance. As U.S. citizens, we might feel a sense of entitlement at times. That we're entitled to, to live a certain lifestyle, entitled to certain luxuries and conveniences. And so difficult then when we're asked to make a sacrifice for the Lord and His church. For as Americans, we're free. And so we're tempted to think, well, as long as I'm not hurting anyone else, 
I can do as I please. Don't tell me what to do. Those are the attitudes of our society. Those are attitudes which are are so very appealing to our, our flesh. And which, unfortunately, we must confess at times we're guilty of as well. And yet, despite the outward appearances, despite the fact that many mock and reject Jesus as king, now he remains king of kings and lord of lords. Like there's all that Jesus suffered at the hands of these Roman soldiers, including then his death on the cross, all of that Jesus suffered willingly for us. Through it all, Jesus remained king. In fact, all of this was prophesied hundreds of years before it happened. For instance, through the prophet Isaiah, we hear the Savior say, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Now, through it all, Jesus remained in control. So that was shown in the Garden of Gethsemane when the armed band of men came to arrest Jesus at Jesus' words, I am he. They fell to the ground, helpless. Jesus reminded the the Roman governor, Pilate, of the fact that the Lord was still in control. He told Pilate, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Even on the cross, as Jesus died, there he displayed that power as he gave up his life. He willingly gave up his life. It wasn't ripped away from him. Luke records in his gospel that Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. And the Apostle John records Jesus' words, "Uh, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. But Jesus, as our King, willingly gave up his life to ransom the world. He willingly carried out God's eternal plan of salvation. Through all of this, he wasn't caught off guard and and forced to die. But as our king, he suffered and died to win for us the victory. And as Jesus most clearly displayed that fact then with his victorious resurrection. Our king lives. Jesus rose in victory over sin, death, and the devil. With his resurrection on Easter Sunday, Jesus very clearly showed that he was victorious. Very clearly showed that he is King and Lord. One day, one day Jesus will return in glory as the victorious King that he is. Now on that day, all will have to confess him as Lord and King. The unbeliever to their great shame, to us, great and glorious day. Apostle Paul writes to the Philippians that God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So we can look forward with great joy to that day. The fact is that when our, <coughs> excuse me, when our life on earth here comes to an end, whether that be at our death or at the end of the world, the Savior will take us to His side in the glories of heaven. Through faith in Jesus, we have been made members of His kingdom. And so even now, He works to rule in our hearts and minds by faith through His Word. As members of His kingdom, we receive with all the blessings that are part of that kingdom. Now just as, as citizens of a country enjoy certain rights and blessings, so as members of Jesus' kingdom, we enjoy certain rights and blessings. We have, for instance, the right to go to God in prayer, to take all of our requests to Him and know that He will hear and answer us. 
We have the blessing of knowing that all of our sins have been forgiven. The blessing of knowing that eternal life and the glories of heaven are ours. And really that list of blessings goes on. And Jesus assures us, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Now, we're members of Jesus' kingdom. We share in all the blessings of that kingdom. Those blessings are certain. Because Jesus, our King, went to war and won them for us. He defeated our enemies. He disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, just as an earthly king was also was charged with caring for his people, well, Jesus also cares for us. In fact, we're assured that right now he is ruling everything for our eternal good. What comfort that is. Especially maybe when troubles and sorrows come into our lives, when we when tragedy strikes, when we see all sorts of terrible things happening in our world. When all of those things we know where to turn. We turn to the Lord who is in control. And our Savior promises to be with us, to to comfort, to strengthen us, to see us through all of those things. But at times He may allow those troubles and sorrows, those trials to come into our lives, He's still in control. His will is going to be accomplished. He promises again that He will use everything for our eternal good. And so what a comfort it is to know that our Savior is providing for all of our needs. To know that He is King. That He is the Almighty God, the Creator of everything. And so there's nothing that He cannot do. His promises are sure. We can trust His protection and His guidance. And what will be our response to all of this? How will we rejoice in His victory and show that joy? Certainly there is joy in knowing that, again, our sins are forgiven, knowing that heaven has been won. We'll also show that joy in one of service, faithful service to our King and Savior. The citizenship has many blessings, but it also brings responsibilities. That citizenship affects the way that we live and act. And so in response to the victory that our Savior has won by His death, that we will dedicate our hearts and minds and lives to Him. And the Apostle Paul encouraged us in our reading last Sunday, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now what our King desires then is the complete dedication to Him and to His will. Now, Jesus is King. On Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem as King. He came to win the victory by His death. Jesus' ascension he serves as His coronation as He ascends to His throne on high and rules all things for our good. And we recognize those as joyous events. But even as we witness Jesus here mocked by the soldiers, as they cry out, Hail, King of the Jews! Even as we view that scene, we can still rejoice. Because we know the end of the story. But we know that even though those words were spoken to mock, that they are true. Yet Jesus is not just King of the Jews, He is King of all. He is God and Savior. What a comfort to know that we have such a loving, all-powerful King who again, even now is in control and ruling for our good. And what a comfort to know that our victorious King will return in glory 
to take us to the glory of his heavenly kingdom. Amen. Please. The peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us join and make confession of the Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Almighty King, no time can dim your glory. How shall we spread abroad your wondrous story? How shall we find some worthy gifts to bring? Whatever of earthly good this life may grant us, we'll risk for you. No shame, no cross shall daunt us. Accept our gift, a tribute to your meekness. With heart and soul and gift, we praise you. Amen. Let's join together in the responsive prayer of the church on page 42, and then follow that with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, our Maker and Preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. You've given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger. Sudden catastrophe tears a crime and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Thank you. 
Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.